There was a moment early that night when Lee remembered that she had wanted to see Rio, to see the streets and the buildings, to get a sense of it as a place, and she felt regret. It was the last thing she remembered thinking. After that, all she could remember were disconnected sights and sounds, feelings. There was the spinning vortex, some dance in which many feathered men were grabbing people, women, right out of the crowd and dancing with them. But it was not so much dancing. It was more they just spun you endlessly clockwise, passing you from one to the next, keeping the rhythm and torque going. She remembered the women with monstrous faces painted on their bellies, her mind grasping at images as the breasts changed from horns to eyes to nostrils, thick red outlines, and pale and green and pink and yellow faces. She remembered the truck with the birds on it, lumbering white birds like cranes and geese, and men bare with their legs in feathered trousers like the ruffled pantaloons of eagles, the waving and the kisses blown and caught. She remembered the odd modulation of the sound as her head fell into the street and then jerked back into the silent alley, the drum beat unbroken but plunging underwater and back out, under and out, while the stars jazzed above, below her head, his hands on her waist holding her in the air like she could fly in the puddle in the water that held the inverted sky. She remembered the pinch that held her neck out, high and extended, and the battering all power and no finesse, the sweat like sandalwood, an incense to purify her from the liar she'd taken in, who took her in, who took. She remembered the high keening of the fiddles and the crazed insistence of the cornet. She remembered that the drums kept watching her, the beat a steady gaze. She remembered the pedicab jolting as she was driven back up the hillside to the address on her ankle, the jerk as the delivery man, job done, lifted her sandaled foot to snap away the tag. She also remembered the way the grain of the uneven pieced wood of the bed on which she'd lain for her day of sleep and forgetting looked like the rice paddies on the stepped fields in Laos. She'd never been to Laos, but she had read National Geographic. No thinking. No thinking about what she'd done. On the plane she saw in the spray of pink micro glitter on the hostess's cheek, the exact molecular structure of the golden paint on the girl who had laughed. She went back to Dallas, back to the very large house she had bought for him, the house with the twin master suites and climbed into her virgin bed, unmaking it. On the first night, she dreamed of storms, rain, and wind. On the next night, she dreamed of lightning only. On the third night, she dreamed of an angry ox. On the fourth night, she dreamed of a cup filled with golden ink. On the fifth night, she dreamed of the clouds, and the clouds were her respite from everything they concealed. On the sixth night, she dreamed of a fish, and the fish was her rival in love. On the seventh night, she turned beneath the down comforter and felt her belly round. She moved back in with her mom. Lee mostly slept and stared. Three months passed. When she heard her mother again at the door, please come down, breakfast is ready. That polite little tap at the door that says, I hope she's okay, and if she doesn't leave soon, I'll go crazy. How can she be home again? She's almost 30. Lee called out, thanks, Mom, down in a sec, and tried to swing her feet over to the unfamiliar carpet in her repurposed childhood bedroom, but they didn't want to go. For five hours, she saw the procession of the constellations across the blue sky through her room ceiling. There are lots more stars in Orion than she had known. And then it was there, between her wiry legs, covered in iridescent slime, the egg. It slid out and lay there like a deflated ice bag, football-shaped, but with deep inward folds. There was a blue cast to it, especially down in those cracks. It was bigger than a red box. 
but she nestled it down in the comforter with her hands. But each time she shifted its weight, one of the folds would pop out to smooth the surface. The surface grew large. She slipped a robe on and left it in her bed, gliding downstairs to the kitchen. The coffee was cold, and her plate lay still on the table with congealed egg and flabby bacon. The afternoon light struck through the little panes by the back door and made squares of brightness in the oil. Her mother had set a flower in a green vase for her. Her father had restrained himself from doing the crossword puzzle. She'd never cared before that they were worried about her. It made her want to get a job. But first, she needed two packages of sliced cheese and a jug of probiotic acai juice and maybe some of those banana cashew Lara bars. And when she got back upstairs, it was clear that she would not be curling up beside the egg on the bed. It was, after all, despite the redecoration, a single bed, a girl's bed, and the egg had puffed and stiffened itself till it was as big as she. She caressed it gently with her cheek and hand and felt the faint echo of the drums mixed with the sound of kids getting off the school bus outside. It was getting cold. She adjusted the down comforter like a cloak and climbed up on top, settling herself slowly like that. Slowly like that until the light outside grew dim and then dark. The hard curve of the egg beneath her felt warm now. On the first night, she dreamt of the Easter Bunny. On the second night, she dreamt of a hagfish. On the third night, she dreamt of ships on a high and angry sea. On the fourth night, she dreamt of Alice falling past cabinets and shelves. On the fifth night, she dreamt of a log flume ride at Six Flags. She was 12, and her best friend was beside her, and they were competing in screams. And on the sixth night, she dreamt of a giant groping sperm its head tipped with acids. When she awoke, Lee was inside. The walls of the egg curved up around her, and the light shone through. She could see the shadow of the comforter on top, like a handkerchief tied at the corners to shelter a bald man from the sun. There was no shadow of her body above her. She was not dreaming of being inside the egg. She was inside. The translucent blue walls rose, curving, smooth as milk. She was the dormouse in a teapot. She was the pearl. She was the tongue behind the teeth. She was the passenger in the air bubble interior of a car sinking beneath a bridge. She was Mike TV pressing against the glass. Gary had cancer, but the cancer was a lie. Well, that sort of lie, her mother said, that sort of lie the gods revisit, he will have it in the end. He had slept with his head in her lap, exhausted from his treatments. He'd kept his separate bedroom with its separate entrance, so careful not to trouble her. Of course I'll marry you. Of course I'll take care of you. We don't need sex to be happy. She felt such a fool. Was she a fool? She dreamed a rain of chemo vials smashing down on him, fuchsia and vermilion and sick chartreuse. The chemical sea rose higher and his arms flailed in the shards. She dreamed of the long-necked lover who had taken her by sequin and feather. She dreamed of a yacht race, Archibald Leach with her, scorning the hot pursuit, 50 following boats and Gary at the prow closest behind them, helplessly receding. His slaves pulled at the oars as he shrieked. She dreamed of her own bed, the tower window and the flames. The wooden horse was in the house of lies, and all were burning together. When she awoke, she filled the egg with her twisting body, so pent that every breath was a compression of herself. The light showed through from outside. She flexed her still silver nails and gently began to tap. 